Managing Director of Transparent Rx, the title of the webinar you saw on the previous slide. And then this is going to be our agenda for today. Before we get started, just a, a real quick summary of, of my background. I think it's very important that you be able to, to, to trust the source of the information that I'm going to be sharing with you today and the next maybe. I'm going to do my very best to keep this thing below 35 minutes. I, I say that every I've been doing these webinars for at least seven or eight years. I say that every single time and I end up going an hour, but I'm going to try and not do that to you. Pack it all into maybe 35, 40 minutes and then give you my contact information, at which point you can follow up if you like. I've been in the business almost two decades. I started out with Eli Lilly, a pharmaceutical manufacturer. Before I left Eli Lilly, I worked in a market access team. I led that team and we were charged with negotiating, paying rebates to PBMs to get our branded products. And my specialty at that time was diabetes care. So that was my portfolio, getting our branded products, uh, the anti-diabetic orals, the insulins, onto the PBM's formulary. I left Eli Lilly, started my own mail order pharmacy, ran that for about five years, became frustrated with the, uh, the, the kind of strong arming from, from uh, wholesalers and drug manufacturers to get product in the inventory. And I'm talking about pricing. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about pricing. And the, the reimbursements, the kind of take it or leave it reimbursements coming back from PBMs. I said, you know what? If you can't beat them, join them. So that is when I decided to start the first fiduciary model PBM. This is not going to be a sales pitch today, folks. My primary goal is to help you, to help your client become a better steward of the pharmacy benefit. It does not sit well with me that PBMs are hiding cash flows from their clients. It's one thing to charge a premium and the and the client know that they know exactly where that money is coming from. And another thing to charge a premium and the client's got no clue where the money's coming from. We're going to talk about some ways to fix that today. If you have any questions for me, there's two ways. You could send them via chat uh, and you have that option on your control panel there. Uh, or you can raise your hand and you see there's a raise hand feature here. You can raise your hand and I can unmute you and then you can pose that question and everyone can hear you. E everyone's muted for, for obvious reasons. Now, three things I want to have happen today. I want you to know how PBMs make money. I want you to feel something about what you learned today, something other than being indifferent to it, because I'm not going to waste your time here. I'm going to give you at least probably eight to 10 great insights, and hopefully one or two of them you'll walk away with and you'll start hammering in on, on, on them to get radical transparency in your pharmacy benefit or your client's pharmacy benefit. And that's kind of the third piece. I want you to take some action on those insights th that I share. Here's the first insight. No question about it. Pricing is a concern for self-funded employers, unions, health systems when it comes to prescription drugs. And there are some tools out in the marketplace today that are addressing those pricing concerns. But every time a tool is created to help contain costs, pharmaceutical manufacturers come up with another another kind of drug category that increases those costs. So we, so we went from small molecule brand drugs, uh, then we went to specialty drugs, biologics, and now we got gene therapies on the way. And those drugs are, are starting at 300K per dose up to 2 million and they are coming. Remember back in 2010, that's when I sold my mail order pharmacy. Remember back in 2010, 
everyone's talking about biologic specialty drugs. It's going to be the new thing and they're going to be expensive. And employer groups just, they just blew it off. Just blew it off. And now they're playing catch up. Same thing with gene therapies. It is on the way. Trust me when I tell you that. And so no easy way exists for PBM clients to eliminate information asymmetry. asymmetry. That is the primary problem. That is what leads to overpayments. And PBMs make it difficult intentionally to ascertain how much they are being paid. This is an example of that. This is a client, and by the way, this is a health plan. Let me say this one more time. This is a health plan who can't get access to their own claims data and are being told by their broker that they can't even get the information from their own internal pharmacy department. And the reasoning is it's proprietary. That's crap. The reason is information asymmetry is what the PBM is using to overcharge his client and they don't want the client to know what that number amounts to. This is an example of information success. So information asymmetry, another way to say that is information failure. This is an example of information success. You may or may not be aware of this, but as a PBM, one of our responsibilities is to go to drug makers and say, look at our book of business, look how many lives we have and the potential uh, dispensation of your drugs that we have. And because of that, we want you to bring down the cost of your drug and do that by paying us a rebate six months, nine months after that drug is dispensed. But literally, and I've been doing this a long time, nine out of 10 PBM clients have never seen rebate remittance report that details at the claim level what the manufacturer paid the PBM for that rebate eligible drug. Now, the imp some of the information in here is redacted or it's been removed, white, uh, uh, whited out for privacy reasons. But Transparent Rx, when we provide this in conjunction with our rebate payments to our groups, all of this information is populated. The point of this information is that plans can now start to see what the net cost of the drug is. Without it, you got no clue. That's why when I talk about eliminating overpayments, eliminating hidden cash flows, containing the cost to offer a pharmacy benefit, it starts with eliminating information asymmetry. So the status quo is this. And this is typically how you get into that information asymmetry pitfall. A plan sponsor will enter into an agreement with a pharmacy benefit manager that calls for an artificially too low administrative fee. That administrative fee is that, that per claim, that per paid claim, that per member, that per, per employee per month fee. That flat fee that a that a, a plan pays, a plan sponsor pays a PBM to, to get access to the PBM's pharmacy network, to get claims adjudicated, to be able to track co-payments and deductibles and 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 uh, see which members are eligible and which ones are ineligible. That's
that's what that fee is for. And so the PBM says, we're not going to charge you an administrative fee. Or we're going to charge you something like a dollar per employee per month or a dollar per pay claim per month. No PBM can survive on that. And so when a plan sponsor accepts that, it inevitably and unknowingly gives the PBM the green light to augment its fee, its management fee through hidden cash flow tactics. And the bulk of that hidden cash flow, remember, and I, I try to repeat things so this sticks in throughout the course of this webinar. Remember, at the end of the day, whatever value isn't transferred back to you or back to your client remains in the PBM's bank account. And when that value isn't transferred, your costs go up. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here uh, in a second. But those three buckets that drive PBM profits, you can see here, manufacturer revenue, in other words, rate rebates, and then you've got the markup or the spreads through mail and the retail pharmacy network. If you didn't believe or buy into the that, that slide I just shared with you, here's a second source of that same information. I can remember when I started out with Eli Lilly, that small molecule brand drugs, that's where the money for, for, for the, the profit, the largest profit share for PBMs that were coming from at that time. And then you got smart. And you, you kind of cut that revenue source off for PBMs. They shifted that cost. Remember, mandatory mail order. Everyone just kind of forced to go, go mail order. PBMs were making massive profits through their, uh, their, their captive mail order pharmacies. And then laws were written, you know, uh, their, their clients said, no, you can't force people to go mail order. And then what happened? Specialty drugs. Specialty drugs. Some PBM contracts are so brazen that they prohibit their clients from receiving specialty drug rebates. They're, they're so they prohibit their clients uh, from receiving specialty drug rebates, and those rebates are massive. Where a small molecule brand drug, the rebate m might be, you know, say for a ninety day script, it could be four or five hundred dollars, maybe six if it's going through mail, something like that, but. For for these specialty drugs, uh, you know, you're you're looking at potentially, you know, four or five thousand dollars per script in some cases, depending on the drug. But if I extend this out, if I extend this out, you, you've gotten smarter about this. And now those revenues for the for the, the non-fiduciary PBM are shrinking in terms of specialty drug rebates, but they've already, they're playing chess, folks. They're playing chess, folks. They've already shifted that lost revenue to the medical benefit side. You think the pharmacy benefit uh, is complicated and you're potentially overspending. It's potentially worse on the medical side. Because there's little oversight by plans, health plan sponsors on the medical side where prescription drugs are concerned. And by the way, those drug claims on the medical side are called MBDCs, uh, medical benefit drug, drug claims. And so here's the point I'm making. I'm not here to bash PBMs. For goodness sake, I own a PBM. 
There's only two types of PBMs when you boil it down. The ones that put their clients' interests above their own and the ones that don't. That makes them either non-fiduciary or fiduciary in their principles and how they behave once the plan goes live. It only makes sense you understand the PBM business model and how we function in the US pharmacy reimbursement and distribution system. As a pharmacy benefit manager, we contract with pharmacies to have sites from which prescriptions can be dispensed to our plan participants. We have to have clients to provide these services to. So we go out and we create these pharmacy networks and it's not as complicated as it may seem. It's really turnkey. We create these large phar pharmacy networks, 60,000 plus, and then we kind of package it and we go to companies and organizations that, that want to offer a pharmacy benefit to remain competitive in the marketplace. And we sell those services. And those clients are third party payers. I touched on some of them already unions, uh, health systems, health plans, large employer groups, municipalities. It's a fairly uh, lengthy list of potential clients for PBMs. Now, when a pharmacy dispenses a pres prescription medication to a plan participant, we have to reimburse that pharmacy. When they are in agreed to enter our network, they agree to pricing terms to participate in that network. And then the client will receive a bill for that dispense prescription. That's where everything starts to get cloudy with the, well, well let me back up. I take that back. It starts to get cloudy here with the services contract because that is what dictates how a PBM can behave. And if it behaves in a way that is not consistent with the services contract, then the PBM's client should have some grounds to be made whole, to be indemnified. Now, well, well, first thing, as a PBM, unless we own mail or uh, specialty pharmacy, we never take control of the product. From a retail perspective, now I get it. You know, there are PBMs that own retail pharmacies. They should be operating independent of one another. They should be not operating together. They should be operating independent of one another. But other than that, we never take control of the product. <laughs> right? So there are three problems with this diagram here. The first one, the inflow of cash in the form of rebates to the third party payer is too low. If 50% of a PBM's profit is coming from the manufacturer, those are monies that would reduce the cost to offer a pharmacy benefit to the third party payer. In other words, PBMs are keeping too much of those dollars and they're going to manufacturers and negotiating not just for the client's benefit, but for theirs. And that's not, that's not, it's not illegal. It's not illegal, but it's bad acting.
especially when the client doesn't know what those dollars amount to. The second problem, the outflow of cash to cover the cost of the prescription drugs that pharmacies are dispensing is too high. Plan third party payers are getting hammered on both sides. I'm going to talk about the second problem, uh, the, the reimbursement to the PBM for the cost of drug here in a second. But here's the third problem that I want to point out. Take a look who sits atop this entire system. You do. Your clients do. Employers do. Unions do. Yet they know the least about how this entire system functions. They are the least sophisticated around this system. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? The reimbursement to the, the PBM for the ingredient costs. I talked about it being too high. The drug pricing standard, which forms the basis for discounted prices, is known as average wholesale price. On the pharmacy side, we refer to it as ain't what's paid because it's just a sticker price. It's just a sticker price. No one pays AWP, yet the basis that determines a third-party payer's cost stems from the AWP. The second type of price is the MAC, maximum allowable cost. It's closer to what the drugs actually cost to put on the pharmacy shelf, to put in the inventory, but it too is higher than what the drugs actually cost. This is something I post on my blog every week, and it shows invoice costs, WAC, and AWP. Right. And so 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 real quick. WAC is the list price at which a wholesaler or other sort of large direct purchaser like a retail pharmacy chain uh, uh, or, or, or a health plan would buy drugs from the drug manufacturer. The WAC is a list price, too. It, it doesn't reflect what a wholesaler would actually pay. It's a list price, but it's just applicable to wholesalers. The average wholesale price is the list price at which a wholesaler or other direct purchaser like a PBM would sell the drugs at. So take a middle note. They are list prices. They are not, they don't, they don't reflect actual cost, what someone actually paid. So let's look at those two price benchmarks. And David, I, and David, by the way, uh, David is on the webinar today with us. He's also in our CPBS course, Certified Pharmacy Benefit Specialist course. My man is all in on learning. I love it. I see your question. Let me get through this. We'll have a break and then uh, and then I'll get to it, David. So we've got two price, two price benchmarks we just talked about, AWP and then WAC. And so let's take a look at uh, at uh, levothyroxine, 100 micro uh, microgram tablets, 30 AWP 561. Let's call it AWP 560. All right. And let's say uh, not not WAC, MAC. And so let's say we're going, this is MAC here, not WAC. So, and let's say the, the MAC, the MAC is not a list price, right? It, it, so if a drug is on the MAC list, that drug will have a price associated with it. That is the price that a, a, a third party payer will pay. So let's say in this example, 
that the the mac price for this drug uh let's call it twenty five dollars now let's say that you are an astute negotiator you have a moderate level of sophistication around the far managing a pharmacy benefit specifically pbm pricing and let's say you negotiate an 85 percent discount from awp that is going to determine what you pay for a generic drug and so 85 percent let's call this uh let's call this 475. so the discount is going to be 475 dollars that leaves folks 85 dollars between the AWP and the discount that you negotiated, that leaves $85. Now, the PBM has got to pay the pharmacy, the cost for the drug, and let's assume a reasonable markup on that because they've got lights and payroll and all that stuff they got to pay, mortgages and leases, all that stuff they got to pay. So they've got to make a, a profit. Here's what I want you to take note of. The pharmacy paid $4 to put this product on the shelf. You see what I mean? Now, you may be thinking, oh, he's making this up. There's no way the AWP could be $560. Yes, way. Yes, way. There is a way. every day every single day awp published prices are no secret in in our platform our clients can go in and and look up the medispan awp for any drug that they want Any any legend drug, it, OTCs I think are in there too. But legend drugs are drugs that require prescription to to be able to to take it home, right? So, uh, but what is often kept a secret is what the drugs actually cost. AWP not a secret. What they actually cost secret until today. And so eighty five thousand. So let's assume that the PBM is generous going to pay the pharmacy what they paid to put the product on the shelf and mark it up 100%. So let's, it's $8, right? The PBM's out of pocket is $8. That leaves the PBM with $77 as a spread. Now, if this drug is on the PBM's MAC list, remember, PBMs control the MAC list, what drugs are on that list, and what the prices are going to be. Now, the PBMs out of pocket of $8 doesn't change. We move that $8 here, the PBM now is pocketing 17 bucks as the spread. That goes directly back to, remember the slide that I talked about, the artificially too low PBM administrator fee. Uh, we're not gonna charge you an admin fee. You think, great, or we're gonna charge you something small. It's gonna cost you maybe $10,000 a, a year, $40,000 a year, but your drug spend is 5 million, but we're only gonna charge you 40 or $50,000 a year. That only happens when you say this is okay, unknowingly. Stick with me here to the end. I'm gonna show you something that's fascinating. More about spreads. The state of Ohio, uh, just a couple years ago, decided, you know what? 
evaluating RFP, PBM RFPs and PBM performance based upon an AWP minus a negotiated discount, that's not working. We've been doing it now for two decades and drug prices still seem to go up exponentially every four or five years. We, we go in, we get a better discount than we had in the previous contract, but nothing's happening. We get bigger rebate guarantees in the previous contract, but nothing's happening. The, the state of Ohio decided, we want to know what you're making. See, remember I talked, the services contract, that's where everything starts. Here's about the fifth insight I'm going to give you. Claims repricings and spreadsheets are a tool. But they should not be the primary focus of determining how good a deal you're actually getting, to, getting into. It's the contract. It's the contract. P PBMs, we don't set prices. We don't, we don't set AWP. We don't set WAC. So the contract is going to determine how much transparency you're actually getting into the true or the final cost. The state of Ohio decided, we want to know what you're making. When they saw and discovered almost a quarter of a billion dollars just in spreads, just in this, a quarter of a billion dollars just in this, they said, oh, no. That's what the PBMs were paying themselves. The state of Ohio decided it was no longer going to play the information asymmetry game. I'm getting to it here in a second. I talked about contract language already. The reason you're here, I'm going to wrap on that, wrap up on that here in a few minutes. Stick with me. Misleading contract language. MAC list, I touched on that, rebates to self-dealing. PBMs, if they are allowed to, can have multiple MAC lists, meaning your MAC list is different than the pharmacy's MAC list. Yes, we have MAC lists with pharmacies. That's how we can ensure equitable reimbursement among pharmacies, fair reimbursement of, of, among pharmacies. But those MAC lists can be different than the MAC list in which we charge uh, used to determine what you need to reimburse to us. That creates a spread. The pharmacy's MAC list is going to be more aggressive in terms of lower prices, more drugs on the list than your list. That creates the spread. Rebates by many names. You saw on the two slides that I shared earlier, 50%. If I go back here really quickly, I go back to these two slides here. If you look in terms of the percentage of profit, this is about 50% from a different source than this one. It's about, they're both the same. What I'm about to share is going to blow your socks off. It's going to blow your socks off here. So, so Mac list. And so when, when PBMs, depending on their business model, either your fiduciary or your non-fiduciary, 
I know there's others out there. People are still stuck on pass through and transparent. We've been playing that game for a decade and a half and drug costs still are going through the roof. Either you put clients first or you don't. It's simple as that. Some PBMs go to manufacturers and they negotiate, okay, let's consider this bucket of dollars a formulary rebate. Let's consider this one an administrative fee. And our clients may believe that this administrative fee is the same type of administrative fee that we charge on a per pay claim basis. They're different. One is, is, is between you and the PBM. This one is between the PBM and the manufacturer. If the contract doesn't stipulate that all of the, the, the manufacturer revenue, no matter what it's called, any revenue coming back from the manufacturer either has to flow back to the PBM's client or at a minimum at least be disclosed. then the likelihood of overpayments go up. Case in point, uh, this information was released maybe about two or three years ago. So there's always a time lag between these kind of lawsuits and when it hits the public. But here's the point I want to make. Express Script sued Kaleo for rebates. It believed Kaleo, which is a, a drug maker, owed Express Scripts. Kaleo, I wasn't in a room, but I'm sure it thought there's no way you're going to sue because then it would become public. So we're just not going to pay. I believe Kaleo owed the money. But the point I'm making here is, is that this is the administrative fee agreed to between these two entities. It dwarfs the formulary rebate. That's a refund that should be flowing back to the plan sponsor. Here is another one, price protection rebates. Sometimes they're referred to as inflationary, you might say inflation uh, rebates or, or fees, things like that. The wording is all across the board, but there's always a couple words that'll make you just jump off the page at you if you're sophisticated to say, okay, you negotiated this with the manufacturer, it needs to flow back to us. These rebates say if the price goes up by X percent within a certain amount of time, then so does the rebate you owe us. Again, those rebates dwarf the formulary rebates. Here's a third type, outcomes. If a drug doesn't perform or meet a certain metric agreed to between the PBM and the drug manufacturer, then the drug manufacturer pays a refund a rebate. This has been going on for a decade. I talked about that shift. Remember this, the specialty drugs and that second, that second diagram uh, the, the the specialty drugs now being the biggest part, but that's that's going that's that's being a smaller amount of the bucket, and now it's going into the medical benefit uh, drug claims because you're getting smarter. So now, what some PBMs are doing is saying we're going to go out and create a, a GPO or group purchasing organization. And then that way, we can, we can negotiate a fee to oversee that group purchasing organization directly with the manufacturer apart from the rebates. Now, mind you, I've been on that side. There's only a there's a finite amount of dollars a manufacturer is going to pay. There's a finite amount of dollars a manufacturer is going to pay in the form of a refund or rebate. 
when a drug, when a claim is adjudicated and generated. If a PBM says, we want a, a GPO management fee of 25%, that leaves 75% that it could then flow back to or pay back to its clients. Even worse, what if that that GPO, that GMF, that, that GPO management fee is 50%? That's what's happening. That's what's happening. As you get more sophisticated, as the law, the, the state laws are already behind. State laws, they're already behind now. They're writing laws, oh, you have to disclose all rebates and you, you have to pay all rebates back. They're not addressing the GPO management fees, which are rebates. So here's the bottom line. You have to start looking at what the PBM is keeping in its bank account. How much is it being paid for being the service provider? The significance of that is that the PBM, here's the, gee, this is the genius of it all. The genius of it all is that whatever we take home as a PBM, Whatever we take home at the end of the month, at the end of the year, is hidden in the plan's final cost because you think the drug costs are going up or are high, or you think the rebates are too low. Wrapping up here. This is public information. It was out on the internet. I just pulled it down. The CEO of CVS at this time said this. And look at that word. You think I'm making it up that the contract is, is the most important determinant of cost? We couldn't even get past a third word from the CEO of CVS Health before the word contract came up. What, this, what the CEO of CVS is saying in that sentence that I circled there, we're going to make, the lamest terms, we're going to make as much money as we can, and the amount of money that we're going to make depends on how sophisticated or unsophisticated our clients are. The sophisticated clients, we have a lower amount of levers to pull. The unsophisticated, we essentially got all the levers available to us to drive our profit. This is an in-house acronym. I hope you adopt it. When I talk about the PBM's management fee, how much they're making, this is the formula. The information you need to calculate it is the tough part. That's why we call it information asymmetry. Everything in green lands in the PBM's bank account. Red would be, remember the, the, the reimbursement distribution system model. Red are, are the monies that leave the PBM's bank account. Remember the, the, the inflow of cash in the form of rebates that we pay once we receive them from the manufacturer? Remember the reimbursements to the pharmacy for prescriptions they dispense to our plan participants? Whatever is left over is the PBM's earnings after cash disbursements. The reason 
that they hang their hats on, this is proprietary. We can't share it with you. It's because they don't want you to know what that number is. The new path says the PBM must at a minimum be radically transparent, meaning you are able to the penny understand where the money is going and where it's coming from. All of it. The best way to go about that is to start with a fair and reasonable administrative fee that's going to start somewhere around $6 per paid claim. And then the PBM contractually obligates itself not to make money any other way. If the PBM is not contractually obligated to make money just one way through that administrative fee, which is radically transparent. You know how many claims, you're only paying on a per paid claim, on a paid claim, and you know the amount. That's radically transparent. Like the state of Ohio discovered, when you start allowing the PBM to make money this way, it's like giving them a blank check. You can't do that. Here's what happens when you do. In 2020, we brought this company on as a new client at the peak of the pandemic. They came in paying $57.88 on a per member per month basis. At the end of 2020, all costs baked in, including our fee, that client reduced their cost by $35 per member per month. You know why? Because we charged a reasonable admin fee and that's it. That $35 PMPM difference between Prime Therapeutics and us is the earnings after cash disbursements. This gives me chills every time I say it. Prime's fee, their earnings after cash disbursements of $35 PMPM was higher than the entire pharmacy benefit should have cost. They were charging more for their fee than what the stinking drugs cost. I talked about the unsophisticated and the sophisticated. That is the difference between paying $57.88 and $23.12 PM PM. I, I said this wasn't going to be a sales pitch. I probably lied just a little bit. But if this interests you and you want to learn more, you want to break into the business, you want to cut your company's cost, you want to get a promotion, whatever it is, take this course. There's not a better one in the industry. That ain't saying a lot because the people making money off of it don't want you to know how it works. We do. My alma mater, I went to business school. This cat, uh, He's, our business school was named after it at Michigan State. I never bothered when I was in school to look and find out who he was. It wasn't until later after college I read his autobiography. I pulled this from his autobiography. This may not mean nothing to you. Maybe this will. He's the only person in the history of the world to be a founder of two Fortune 500 companies. Upon retirement, he spent a great deal of his time in medical research. He might know, and his money, by the way, he might have an idea of what he's talking about. Last thing I'm going to say, and then I'll get to any questions that have come in. I know nothing about automobiles. Spent my, 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 my formative, my adult 
professional career in the state of Michigan. I know nothing about automobiles. But when I walk into a repair shop, I don't want them to know that. So I fake it. I get the list of things that need repaired. I pick something that I don't don't think and I say, I don't think I need this. I think you're just putting this on here because you want to make money. There's other things I accept. I'm sure I probably don't need that they put on there because they want to make money. My only defense is to act knowledgeable without actually being knowledgeable. And I'm sure it's cost me a lot of money. Don't be like me when it comes to pharmacy benefits. A car is one thing. This is life and death for some people. And overpaying for pharmacy benefits can lead to that. It trickles down to your employees and their family. Get educated around the pharmacy benefits industry. Okay, that is my time today. Uh, I want to see here. Um, question: When when do you think gene therapies will hit the market? They've already hit the market, but they are not. They're not a big part of the market yet. I use the example of biologics and specialty drugs. It was only 10 years ago that they first started to hit the market. And now look at their market share. 50% of, the, of the, the, the pharmacy dollar is specialty drugs right now. Gene therapies, it'll take time, but they are going to be that. They are going to have that sort of market share soon. But the point is, David, you got to get prepared right now. Don't repeat what happened with specialty drugs.